Hi, uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? My name is John Friedman. I'm an economics professor here at Brown University. And I also uh, was a founding co-director of Opportunity Insights, which is a research lab that seeks to understand inequality and upward mobility and ultimately help find solutions to help more children rise out of poverty. And before the pandemic, Opportunity Insights um, had done some work on the relationship between income inequality and K-12 education, correct? That's right. We, in a number of different contexts, uh, K through 12 education, in higher education, it seems like education is a key mediator, both of the existing inequality that we see in this country, where lower income children are much less likely to get higher levels of education than children from higher income families. But it's also potentially a very important policy tool to addressing income inequality by giving more children from low income or other otherwise disadvantaged backgrounds the opportunity to get high quality education. We can help more of them rise out of poverty. And have you received feedback about the fact that your work, uh, I'm thinking possibly for the first time, made it possible pe for people to visualize this? For instance, two children's kindergarten trajectories and the life outcomes? So it is, we, we put a lot of thought into thinking about how to convey uh, the substance of our findings uh, after we've uh, figured out actually what we want to say. So I've, uh, you know, it's great to hear that some of that thought seems to be making a difference. Excellent. Um, so you built a pandemic tracker last spring. How did that come to be? So at the start of the pandemic, we went from being fully open as an economy to being closed almost everywhere in the space of about two weeks. And we just had no idea what was going on. Was the economy going to suffer a really deep hit? Uh, was it going to be more of a mild hit? Uh, which people in the economy would be suffering more, what policies that people were thinking about would make a difference. And the traditional economic statistics, uh, which are you know, amazing resources published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the Bureau of Economic Analysis, they just aren't geared up to provide the type of quick feedback or granular measurement of what's going on uh, that we really needed. So we reached out to a number of different private companies who in their own data sets have an enormous amount of information about what's going on in the economy to see if we could draw on this other resource to bring more timely and more granular information to understand how this uh, pandemic was affecting the economy. So for instance, uh, the government publishes statistics on how much different households are spending, um, but they don't do so until really the end of each quarter. Um, and more granular measures like, uh, you know, did spending fall more for higher low income households, that actually doesn't come out till about a year later. Uh, but what we did is work with a company that aggregates uh, different credit card payments to measure in almost real time how different spending levels were changing for different types of people uh, in different industries uh, in, in different parts of the country. Uh, and so, you know, this is just one example. We have measures of spending, we have measures of small business revenue, measures of unemployment. And we were not only able to get these data and process them to make them informative, but we also made it, you know, a key component of what we wanted to do to make this information available to as many people as we could. And so there's a website, tracktherecovery.org, where you can go and see all of these variables measured not just at the national level, but at the very local level, you can see it by state, uh, by county, or for certain large cities. So for instance, uh, it's not just good for researchers, but if you're the mayor of Providence and you wanna understand how is COVID-19 affecting the economy in Providence, um, you know, those aren't statistics that are easily available. We hope that this would be a resource for uh, state and local policy making all over the country. So can you talk to our readers about the difference between a typical recession and a K-shaped recession and how you began to see that there was a, there was a K opening here? Sure. So when the pandemic hit, employment and spending fell very, very quickly. Uh, so just to give you a sense, um, employment on average uh, jumped to 14% uh, 
unemployment jumped all the way to 14% in just one month. And, and even if they, you know, if we hadn't had certain issues with the technical interpretation of survey responses, it probably would have gone up to more like 20%. You know, and as, a, as a benchmark in the entire great recession 10 years ago, employment really never got higher than 10 or 11%. And so these were just unprecedented levels of unemployment uh, that we'd not seen since, uh, you know, really the great recession um, nearly a hundred years ago. But uh, while we saw everyone enter the recession very sharply, we started to see a real divergence coming out of the recession. And so high income individuals, while they suffered a quite steep decline in employment in April into May, they also saw a very sharp rebound in employment, such that by the time we got to the beginning of July, employment levels were essentially back to where they were before the pandemic started, right? The recession was over for high income individuals. In contrast, lower income individuals suffered a much steeper decline at the beginning of the recession. And while they did recover pretty quickly through uh, May and June, that recovery only got them to about halfway back to where they were before the pandemic. And then the recovery stalled. And so what we were left with was a very uneven recovery where you know, some people talk about V-shaped recoveries where it kind of comes down and then goes back up very quickly. That's basically what we saw for high income individuals, but we saw something very different for low income individuals. Uh, and so some people started calling it a K-shaped recession in the sense that uh, it's really two diverging paths where uh, this recession was really exacerbating inequality by bringing employment back very quickly for high income individuals um, and leaving this incredibly large uh, employment gap um, that, that's actually still persisting uh, today uh, for uh, lower income individuals. Employment is still about 20% down uh, on the pre-pandemic uh, levels. So Shalini Sharma told me, uh, the co-founder of Zern, when I was asking her about her data set ending up in your recovery tracker, um, she told me that she knew you from her time at Brown. Can you describe how you ended up with Zern's app data? Sure. So uh, first, uh, right, Zern is, she's probably giving you this already, but uh, Zern is a really neat uh, online educational app where it's working to teach children in grades one through five math. But unlike many online apps, which are used uh, kind of as a side feature or an add-on by students on their own uh, for math, Zern is by and large used as part of the weekly classroom routine. So that even before the pandemic, you could see students logging in and completing uh, modules uh, all throughout the year. Now, before the pandemic had started, uh, Shalini, who's a Brown grad, got uh, connected to me. And so we met and we talked about various different things that we could do with Zern. Um, and so there was already an active conversation that was happening about how we could make use of this data, which much like the economic data that we were gathering, gave really a week by week measure of how much progress students were making uh, in math in the classroom. And so once the pandemic started, we connected again, and this was a really natural way to try to get that same kind of real time information to understanding what was going on in our schools in the same way that we wanted to know what was going on in the economy. And so, uh, you know, just as we tried to measure employment and how far it was falling and for whom it was falling as the pandemic hit, we did the same thing with uh, math education uh, using the Zern data. So we saw the level of usage for students in classrooms across the country uh, up to when the pandemic hit. And then we saw a very steep decline in usage as everyone went to remote learning in the middle of March, 2020. But just as we saw for employment, we saw students from different backgrounds responding to this initial shock very differently. So for students in higher income schools, while there was this initial decline in usage, things recovered over the next few weeks so that by the time you got to the end of April, 2020, students were making just as much progress through Zern as they had been in the weeks before the pandemic started. But in contrast, students from lower income schools, uh, their usage did recover a little bit, but it uh, 
really only got back uh, just barely above uh, half the progress per week that we saw before the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, that really paints that same picture where uh, in education, as in unemployment, this recession is exaggerating, is, is exacerbating that inequality in education um, that we see uh, existing in the US beforehand. So, and given what you learned in your previous research, was there anything surprising about your findings? I think the speed at which this inequality grew up was really surprising. Uh, right? We know that students from different backgrounds have access to different quality of education on average in the US. But seeing, uh, you know, even if you compare students in the same city, right? So this doesn't even have to be students in different school systems, but literally students in different elementary schools in the same large urban school system you saw that students from higher income areas were rebounding much more quickly than were students from lower income areas. And I should say this wasn't something that only appeared last spring, right? After the summer, you might think this gives everyone a chance to organize a little bit, understand how to do remote learning or uh, whether to bring people back in person, how to do hybrid learning. You actually see a pretty similar gap emerging where all through uh, academic year 2021, students from lower income families at these schools uh, were making progress in Zern um, at about a 20% uh, discount to uh, what we saw for students from uh, higher income backgrounds. And so, you know, that adds up over the course of the year, right? That's like missing a month and a half of school uh, in terms of the progress that you're making. Uh, and I think, you know, this is incredibly worrying, right? If we think that education is one of the key pathways towards allowing students to climb out of poverty, what we've seen here is that, you know, we already had this uh, deep inequality in American education uh, and the pan pandemic has just made it so much worse. Uh, the pandemic has taken children um, and kind of set them even further back. Uh, and so I think without some really dedicated effort to get these students caught up, um, I, you know, I think, what we've seen from broader data is that these types of educational uh, gaps that arise in childhood uh, can persist. They create lower college enrollment rates, lower college graduation rates. Um, students earn less when they get out in the labor market. Uh, these things can have really large effects uh, down the line. One of the stories we've prepared that uses your data as a jumping off point looks at income inequality and other indicators in Washington, DC and at what we're calling the K-shaped kindergarten because so many children did not show up last year and will show up next year prepared and less prepared in other ways. Um, is there, one of the things that that story looks at is the relationship between the different factors in your tracker. So for instance, how employment and spending and small business revenue relate to one another and how in the life of a child that might live in a multi-generational household with higher rates of disease and death, um, et cetera, those factors could compound. Is that something you're able to speak to? So yeah, I think that the fact that this recession, this pandemic has had such an unequal effect in so many dimensions, right? It's not only had students from lower income families experiencing greater uh, educational delay. Uh, the adults in those families have suffered from higher levels of unemployment. Um, and especially the uh, older adults in those families have suffered higher mortality rates as a result of COVID-19. The, the death rates have been uh, much higher. I mean, they were higher already to start with, right? We've documented very large uh, gaps across the income distribution and uh, the racial distribution um, for mortality rates in this country, but uh, those gaps got worse in the pandemic. Um, and so I think, you know, all of these things uh, can compound where, you know, maybe a student who can't attend school in person, uh, but has a really stable family um, at home, uh, that child has the resources to um, kind of make it through um, what's going on at the school uh, much better than a student where, you know, parents are becoming unemployed, 
uh, relatives may be much more likely uh, to be dying as a, as a result of COVID-19, or even if they're not dying, they're having serious illness. Uh, that's one of the things that we see in the data as you look through uh, the 20, 2021 academic school year, which is that when students are attending school remotely, you see a huge uh, gap in the performance of uh, high versus low income uh, children. And that gap actually seems to reverse itself when you have those students attending in person. Um, and so that's something about uh, how this type of uh, remote learning environment is kind of even more taxing for uh, children from, from low income families. And I, you know, I think this is more generally uh, an example of how you see that um, just higher income families, uh, they're more resilient to you know, various shocks that come along because I think they have uh, a little bit um, greater leeway to kind of adapt what they're doing or, or adjust. Um, and that's either because of resources or just a, you know, a more stable situation. Uh, when families are living in poverty and they're kind of quite close to the edge already, um, you know, even a, a single shock can send them kind of over the edge. And especially in a recession like this, where you can have two, three shocks coming at you at once, uh, it just may be more than people can deal with. Do you want to leave us with any policy prescriptions? So, I mean, we've had this problem of inequality uh, and inequality in education for many years now. And as I said, this pandemic has only made the situation worse. And so I think the only silver lining, if there is one, to come out of this pandemic is that sometimes you need a major shock like this in order to get people to wake up and really understand how much of a problem this is and how much uh, of a policy change we need in order to make a serious effort towards this um, in order to close these gaps going forward. So for instance, you know, if you think about the mortality gaps even, right? COVID-19 was particularly bad for uh, low-income families, but uh, the extent to which COVID-19 was worse for low-income families is only a small share of the extent to which mortality rates are already higher for low-income families relative to richer families, even in 2019 or 2018. You know, and the same thing I think is that uh, COVID-19 has uh, really increased income inequality in education, but uh, that increase was kind of for one year, the size of what we normally see uh, for students, even in normal pre-pandemic years. Uh, and so again, there's something about having this big, big of a shock, which really wakes people up and makes them open to thinking about uh, policy solutions uh, at a scale that perhaps they really never considered before. And so you've already seen this in programs like the American Rescue Plan, uh, some of the earlier uh, stimulus packages that, that were passed, really you know, putting unprecedented amounts of money into supporting the economy. And what I really hope we can do is not have that be a one-time thing where we then kind of go back into um, uh, you know, a more conservative mode. I think hope we really can you know, take that um, active stance where we don't just want to uh, manage inequality, we really want to try to combat it, um, and especially through upward mobility by increasing these opportunities for children from all backgrounds. So I think that's, uh, that's really what we need. Have we left anything on the cutting room floor? Are there questions you want so. to answer? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's interesting stuff around why unemployment isn't falling faster, but I think that's probably a little bit too narrow uh, for, uh, for the broader, uh, broader focus that you're after here. You know, um, not so much for the people who hopefully will view the video of this Zoom, um, but for me, it would be helpful to have the one or two sentence explanation of how consumer spending and small business revenue diverge. Yeah, so I think, um, the, you know, the main story is that people are shifting the places where they're spending their money. Um, and so I wouldn't, my sense is that the extent to which uh, small business revenue and spending diverges on our tracker overstates the things nationally a little bit, just because of the type of small businesses that we're, um, you know, that, that we're measuring. But I think, you know, if you want to have an intuition, right, people are spending more now than they were before the pandemic as a result of not only the stimulus, but all the opening and everybody sort of saved a whole bunch of money during the pandemic uh, that they now want to go spend but they're much more likely to be spending it online at Amazon than they are at their local small business. 
and I, you know, I hope that again, as things continue to reopen, uh, that will turn a little bit. Uh, we've seen spending at restaurants and things like that really start to go up uh, in the last couple of months. Um, but for much of the pandemic, you know, it's been spending at Amazon instead of your local small business. And that's really driven the, you know, spending had really recovered nearly to pre-pandemic baseline, um, you know, by the time we hit the holidays last year, whereas small business revenues were still uh, really quite low. Sweet. This was fun. Thanks so much. <laughs>